The title of the address tonight is Do the Words Still Matter Anymore? It's a, it's a provocative question. And uh, we're going to get into what I think is going to be maybe a pointed discussion tonight about the law and where it's going. Uh, so before we start, uh, Justice Stratus, uh, is this something you really want to do? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, I think uh, as a public official, I am a judge. That makes me a public official. It's very important that this branch of government, the judicial branch, be visible and transparent and work as hard as it can to increase the understanding of the public and the participation of the public in what we do. There's a long tradition of judges furthering study and education. In particular, many of the current judges of the Supreme Court are very, very active in education and study. Education and study we like to promote because our view is a well-informed populace, and in particular, a well-informed, knowledgeable, stimulated legal profession furthers debate. It allows people to think about their role of the legal system, the legal system itself, how it ought to operate, and so on. And this allows the institution of the legal system, and frankly, the judiciary, to progress. Mm -hmm. The one thing that's important, though, is I have a day job. I'm a judge. And what I think the reasonable, well-informed person here would know is that regardless of what I say today, which is meant to provoke thought and reflection and contribution later on your part, uh, if you come into my courtroom and even though you might hear me be critical about a particular legal development, if you tell me not to follow a Supreme Court of Canada decision, I will probably laugh at you because I'm bound in our system of jurisprudence. I am bound by the law as it applies to me. That's both the laws of parliament and legislatures and the law of the Supreme Court of Canada. And so that's the bottom line thing. Mm -hmm. I am impartial and independent as a jurist, but most importantly, I want it to be seen that I'm impartial and independent. And that's always the bottom line in participating in sessions like this. And I've participated in many sessions before, all sorts of organizations of different hues, and I'm very honored to be here today. And uh, one of those sessions was the Law and Freedom Conference three years ago, uh, you gave a talk that, I, I don't know if we can say went viral on YouTube, but as legal talks can go viral, I think a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people watched it. And it was the same year that coincidentally we started the Running Meat Society. I, I know for me, it was an inspirational talk because you spoke a lot about, uh, I think the talk was the decline of doctrine, and I think it was inspirational for a lot of people, and it got them thinking about these topics. But I also know that after that, uh, you know, you rankled uh, some people, you ruffled some feathers, and uh, my sense is you that's occurred at some other talks too. So are, are you worried about that? If people... Um, if people come out, uh, private citizens, if they come out after this and they say, oh, Justice Stratus is speaking extrajudicially, he shouldn't be doing that, or, or he said this and I think that's completely foolish or whatever, I mean, do you have any problem considering that you, you can't fight back? As a judge, you basically have to say, well, these are private citizens and they're entitled yeah, to their views? There's a lot there in that question. Uh, going back to 2016, that speech I gave, the theme of the speech is that we need to work hard in the area of constitutional and administrative law, what we call public law, to build doctrine. Because, say, 30 years down the road, there's a terrible crisis and some poor judge has to make a very important legal decision about the government's conduct during a crisis. Do we want that judge relying on settled doctrine, doctrine that's been settled for decades, or do we want to judge just relying on her or his personal views or ideologies? And my case was that, you know, the former will lead to a decision that's more likely to be respected and ensure a degree of social and political order than someone who's just seen to be 
another political actor. That did ruffle some feathers, there's no doubt about it, but on the other hand, it emboldened other people to, to speak and to think, and I think the next product was, especially in law schools, I might add, a really good discussion about how the legal system ought to operate. And I was proud to, to further that discussion. This issue of popularity, though, I must say, I, like any other human, it's nicer to be liked by people than to be sort of not liked by mm -hmm. people. Um, but um, moving to today's theme, I'm a judge. And I'm not currying public favor. I have to do the right thing that the law tells me to do. And the zone of me doing what I'd like to do in some idealized world is minimal and sometimes absolutely non-existent. And my case is, I believe that's how it should be. So popularity, nice thing for a legislator, but I'm not a legislator. Okay, that's true. So, without further ado, I, I want to start by reading you two quotations. Okay. I'm not going to tell you who said each of them, except to say they're both, they both come from ex-Chief Justices of the Supreme Court. And after I read them to you, I want you to tell me which one you like more. Okay. Okay. Okay, here's the first one. The judicial function in considering and applying statutes is one of interpretation and interpretation alone. The duty of the court in every case is loyally to endeavor to ascertain the intention of the legislature and to ascertain that intention by reading and interpreting the language which the legislature itself has selected for the purposes of expressing it. In this process of interpretation, the individual views of the judge as to the subject matter of the legislation are, of course, quite irrelevant. To start with presumptions as to policy is to enter upon a labyrinth for the exploration of which the judge is provided with no clue. So that's That judge needs to take a legal writing course. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little long, but I yeah. get it. I get it. Okay. So that's the first one. That's Here, number one. The okay. second one is pithier. Yep. Uh, judicial lawmaking is no longer confined to small incremental changes. Increasingly, it is invading the domain of social policy, once perceived as the exclusive right of parliament and the legislatures. Right. Option A, in my view, the first quote, is more consistent with, in my view, the judicial role. Okay. So option A is Chief Justice Duff from a 1935 decision, R. R. Du Bois, and he, uh, Chief Justice Lyman Duff was Canada's longest serving Supreme Court justice in history. So you're saying I'm a 1935 jurist? <laughs> I'm not saying that. I guess that. so. Uh, the, the second one came from Chief Justice McLaughlin, uh, speaking extrajudicially. Extra uh, and Chief Justice McLaughlin was Canada's longest serving Chief Justice. Right. So two, uh, probably the two longest serving Supreme Court justices in Canadian history. Uh, Gerard Kennedy will tell me if I got that wrong, I know. But uh, they're saying pretty opposite things. Yeah. Um, so why, why do you prefer option A? Well, first of all, and we'll get to this, there's one element in option A I don't like, this notion of intention of the legislature. And I suspect we'll get to that. Yeah. Because I think the role of a jurist is to interpret the words uh, the literal meaning of the words used by Parliament seen in their proper context and in light of the overall purpose. And we can't divine intentions mm -hmm. underneath the words for a host of reasons we can get into. But I think it goes down to really fundamental constitutional arrangements that are time-honored and one at the cost of, of uh, much bloodshed centuries ago. And it's this, that legislators formulate policy and make law. We see this in section 91 and 92 of the Constitution Act 1867. The opening words, the exclusive power to make laws. Those words appear, or something like them, at the beginning of section 91 and 92. And that exclusive power is in the people we elect, the House of Commons and, and the provincial legislators. Mm -hmm. 
So the lawmakers, the people who take personal policies and promote them into binding rules, that's their job. Our job is different. It's law application. And I think there are other reasons other than that fundamental constitutional arrangement that dictate that this be so. Uh, the principle of the rule of law, which appears in the preamble to our 1982 constitutional document. The aspect of the rule of law that the law will be applied to all mm -hmm. without fear or favor and be applied consistently. So uh, if my colleague who will uh, see tomorrow, Justice Peter Lowers, who I see in the audience, if he's the judge and you and I have identical cases, mine's in the morning, yours is in the afternoon. I draw Justice Lowers and on my facts, I win. In the afternoon, if you have another judge, if the rule of law is acting properly and law application is only involved, it is quite likely that the same result will follow. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it ought to be. And why, why ought it to be that way? I mean, I well, agree it with ought you, to but... be that way because uh, we live, it's often said, we live in a government of laws, not of, and the quote usually is men, I guess we should now say people, of course. We don't have a government of people, we have a government of laws. And the outcome of cases and the content of laws should not depend on the individual quirks or identity of the individual. Rather, as much as possible, it should depend on the objective meaning of the laws that our democratically elected politicians pass. And if we don't like those standards, we vote the bums out. Right. Well, you mentioned the rule of law. I mean, I, I think I'm on record as supporting the rule of law. Uh, there's some justices, the academic scholars, lawyers, and justices who, you know, maybe they don't deride the rule of law, but they would say the rule of law is not anywhere close to being a, a sufficient concept. I think Justice Abella, you know, ha has said things to the effect that, you know, uh, antebellum America had the rule of law, Nazi Germany had the rule of law, and, and she's called for a rule of justice. Uh, maybe not to supplant the rule of law, but at, at the very least to uh, supplement the rule of law. And so, what do you have to say about that? Well, I, I have a couple of things to say. First of all, uh, a word or two about Justice Bella. Uh, we have had lunch together. We get along. When we have a swearing in of a federal court judge, we do it at the Supreme Court of Canada, and she often will grace, grace uh, us with her presence mm -hmm. in support of the courts, and there's an opportunity to speak with her. You know, the marvelous thing about many of our governmental institutions, including the judiciary, is there are different points of view. And we can debate these things in a civil, friendly way. But I, I, won't, I won't sugarcoat it. I, I don't agree with that view of hers. And I don't agree only because uh, several reasons. I've given the constitutional reason. I've given the rule of law reason. Let me give you another reason. Uh, I have much less faith than she has about the capability of courts as an institution and judges as people to do justice. Judges in our system, to be a superior court judge, you have to be a lawyer for 10 years. I think if we studied it, you'd see as a practical matter, most judges are lawyers for 20 years. That's a pretty narrow pool of people to start with. Mm -hmm. And as, as you may know, the longer you practice law, the more specialized you get. You often, the experience of most lawyers is things get narrower. Right. You're certainly not interacting with the public at large. You're only interacting with clients as you see them. In terms of social problems, you're only seeing social problems once in a while and only through the lens of a client and usually only a particular aspect of what may be a broader problem, but the broader problem is beyond your remit. You're working really, really hard if you're a lawyer, mm 
And I'll say this, if you're going to be tipped for judicial appointment, you're probably going to be a good lawyer. And good lawyers are often rich lawyers. Now let me ask you, if you're designing a society from scratch, and you know, your vision of a judge is that they should do justice and be fair and, and do what you think personally is best to litigants, who would you choose for that role? I would suggest a narrow-minded lawyer who's only been doing lawyering for 20 years with bucks stuffed in their pockets and their bank accounts pregnant with money is probably the last person that we would choose for that job. I think the statute, the Judges Act, and the judicature provisions of the Constitution require judges to be lawyers for a reason. Mm -hmm. Our job is not to do what's right, certainly not in a Judge Judy sense. We're lawyers. Right. We are to apply doctrine. We are to interpret laws. We are to assist the court in applying them to people uh, fairly and impartially. So let's get to sort of the meat and potatoes of this talk then. Sure. Uh, how to interpret statutes. Uh, there's probably some people in the audience who aren't lawyers. Those who are lawyers can probably recall, you know, what the proper methods of statutory interpretation sure. are. But if you, if you had to sum it up uh, just in a general way, how should statutes be interpreted? Right. I, it's really well accepted in this country the, the rule, the, the recipe that we're supposed to follow. You look at the words of the provision. You have to view the words in their context, sometimes surrounding uh, sections or the use of the word elsewhere in the statute sheds light on its meaning. And we have to look at the purpose of the statute or the provision within the statute and what the intended role right. of that provision is. That's the recipe. Where, where do you get purpose from, though? I mean, is that something that you... Well, that's, that's uh, a really controversial issue. Yes. <laughs> uh, the purpose, I believe, has to emanate from the statute itself that you look at the text of the structure you, uh, of the statute, you look at what the legislature was trying to achieve, what policy it was trying to implement, you look to the text to ensure that the purpose that you're defining is the right scope. Let me give an example. Certain social benefits legislation, the purpose is obviously to give individuals in need a social benefit. But when you start to look at the language of the statute, there's a limit to the benefit they get. There's a qualification to the benefit. And so it, the purpose is not just to give benefits and, and, and ensure that people are looked after. That would be too great a purpose in the statute. Right. It's probably a narrower one, which is perhaps, for instance, to give disability benefits to individuals who satisfy a statutory definition of disability. No more, no less than that. But as you say, though, it's controversial. Uh, I mean, there are, the same way that some justices would say that justice is more important than law, or at least equally as important, a lot of justices in interpreting statutes will say, well, let's not just look at the words, and let's not just look at the obvious purpose, let's look at you know, deeper purposes. Yeah. Uh, and let's interpret the statute in light of that. Let's see it through the, the lens. You'll hear that word a lot, lens. Yeah. Uh, whenever I, I hear the word lens, I, I get very, yeah. I, I get a little scared when I hear the word lens because it's usually a very uh, opaque lens. That, yeah. uh, so uh, is that something that you have come across, this sort of debate on, on how to interpret purpose and what, how oh, that certainly. purpose affects the interpretation? Oh, certainly. I think, uh, first of all, um, some of you may wonder why are we talking about this topic. Um, statutory interpretation issues explode in courtrooms every day. You know, a big charter case, three to five days a year in my court, there might be a really contentious, full-blown uh, charter case that I personally would have to uh, 
have to look at. But statutory interpretation cases are very, very, very frequent. They typically arise, you know, if we're dealing in my court with an administrative tribunal and you're trying to understand as a matter of statutory interpretation whether they have the power to do what they do. So what we're talking about isn't something it can sound esoteric, but it is not esoteric. Right. This is mainstream stuff and goes directly to the role of the judiciary. I think the definition of purpose of a statute is key. That in most cases, when statutory interpretation goes off the rails, usually a judge has misapprehended the purpose. Let me give an example okay. just to make this a little more, uh, a little more uh, concrete. Um, there's uh, a Supreme Court of Canada decision that came out earlier this year called West Fraser. And it can be argued that the majority misapprehended the purpose and put it too high, and that the minority, Justice Brown and Justice Cote, had it right. And here's the case for saying that. The case concerned an occupational health and safety prosecution, a worker safety issue on a site. And the accused in this case was a, a owner of the facility, not an employer. The employer was a different entity. The statute, when you analyze it, and this is how the minority put it. I'll, I'll describe how they put it. The statute, very carefully in its wording, drew distinctions between how owners are treated and how employers are treated. Right. And it captures owners for certain purposes, employers for other purposes. And they said, look, we're dealing with an owner here. And they were unconvinced that the prosecution session, section applied to an owner. Right. And they did so because the words didn't take them beyond that and the purpose didn't take them beyond that. The majority, what they did is they said, well, the whole statute is about worker safety and ensuring worker safety. And they cast the purpose as broad as possible. Thus, the interpretation of this provision has to fit that grand purpose. And therefore, owners should be captured in the definition right. and thus subject to prosecution. Now, what the dissent would say, and I'm going to put words in their mouth and sort of paraphrased for simplicity, but what the dissent would say is the majority rewrote the statute. Mm -hmm. That the legislature, who constitutionally makes the laws in this country, uh, has defined distinctions between owners and employers carefully, and they ran roughshod over it right. by ascribing a larger purpose than what uh, a proper interpretation of the statute would involve. Now, um, and thus, some bystanders who are sympathetic with the dissent might say, that's overreaching, that's a court uh, rewriting yes. legislation going beyond its role. Right. I, um, I was going to ask you about this when we got into constitutional interpretation, but um, the fact that you brought up Wes Fraser, it, your, your comments remind me a lot of the Nadan reference, because to me, that, that is like the quintessential example of the court inventing a purpose in order to reach a result, uh, where you have a statute that says only that uh, three justices must come from Quebec. There's nothing in the statute at all that speaks to the necessity of Quebec social values, et cetera. And, and the purpose of that statute, which textually was to have three justices from Quebec and we can infer maybe because they would have expertise in civil law, yeah. uh, suddenly that became having you know, the right values and being in touch with Quebec culture and not really understanding what that even means, but elevating that purpose in such a way that uh, Justice Nadon no longer fell into the purpose and was able to be excluded. Yes. That certainly was the view of Justice Moldaver in dissent. And he didn't quite put it that way, but that was certainly the, the tenor of his, uh, of, of his opinion, uh, that the majority had overshot the purpose in a way similar to how I just described West Fraser. The impact of it uh, creates an, uh, what some would say is an absurdity, and I want to deal with absurdity arguments in a moment, but 
the absurdity is this, that in the case of Justice Nadan, an individual who was born in Quebec, learned his first words in French in Quebec, was educated at all levels in Quebec, went to university in Quebec, met his wife-to-be in Quebec, married his wife in Quebec, worked in Quebec as a lawyer, as a student, as an associate, as a partner. Uh, then he's appointed in the Federal Court of Appeal as a judge from Quebec. It's Quebec, 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 Quebec. And the strange result of the case, uh, as, as Justice Moldaver points out, is that um, somehow he fails because he doesn't have Quebec values in the statute uh, allows someone to be appointed from the Federal Court of Appeal uh, only if they're not from Quebec. Those from Quebec have to come either from the Bar of Quebec or Quebec courts because only those people have Quebec values. Right. And, you know, this, it strikes the ear as problematic, to be sure. Okay. Uh, and, and I have to confess to uh, a, a certain inclination on this because I'm from uh, the very court involved, the Federal Court of Appeal, and I work all the time with Justice Nadon, who's an excellent jurist. And um, I, I want to go back to but text. It's, it's tricky. Yep. One cannot, in assessing the purpose of legislation, yes. one has to be very, very careful not to overshoot the purpose. Right. And again, I think the indicators of purpose have to come from what the legislator, uh, what the legislator drafted. Um, there is a temptation, I don't know if you want to go here, but there is a temptation of some to look to extraneous materials like politicians' speeches in well, Parliament let's to go determine there. the purpose. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, there is this tendency, yes. and you see it in decisions from time to time, reliance on Hansard as uh, evidence of, of what the legislators wanted to achieve, committee reports, testimony before committees, uh, that sort of thing. And I must say it can be very problematic. And I would uh, express a degree of degree agreement with today's dissent by Justices Brown and Cote uh, in, in the Frank decision on expatriate voting. In that dissent, they talk about the unreliability of these extraneous materials as indicators of purpose. You know, the problem is this. An MP, even a minister, gets up to speak while there are only one elected representative out of over 300 that vote and consider the legislation. Sometimes we know that ministers, while they're responsible for introducing legislation, the legislation reflects what the government as a whole may want. The minister may personally disagree or prefer other provisions in it. In other words, as a corporate body, the legislature doesn't have an intention. It's a multi right. person body. And so any quest for legislative intention, you know, sort of looking at what everybody said, that would be harder than archaeology to try and unearth a skeleton of a, of, of a prehistoric animal. I mean, the only reliable indicator has to be the words that they express themselves in. And you know, the advantage of that, Asher, is that gives a common starting point mm -hmm. for lawyers, the public, and judges. We all look at the same thing, right. the words of the statute, and try and do our best with them. You will get examples, though, of statutory language that's vague or ambiguous, and if we accept the premise that we need to understand the words, there will be times, I think, you tell me what you think, where we'll need to go to Hansard or extraneous sources, not to understand the purpose, but to inform us about the meaning of the words. Uh, maybe we might get to this in the constitutional portion, but the principles of fundamental justice. Yeah, I must say, you know, people, people cite it to us. And some of my colleagues are very attracted to it. Uh, I'm a little more pessimistic about it. You're hearing that from me. We certainly receive the evidence. Uh, 
and consider it what it's worth. In a particular decision I wrote, and much of what I'm saying today emanates from decisions I've written that are on the books, um, the uh, uh, Williams decision, I didn't forbid looking to these materials in part because the Supreme Court has said over and over again, majorities of the Supreme Court says we can, we can look at them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, on occasion, the Supreme Court has said, and I think quite properly, uh, we have to look at these materials uh, with a great deal of caution. Justice Lemaire, as he, as he then was, said that in motor vehicles, right. that we can look to these extraneous materials, but great caution has to be exercised. And I think that's right. You know, the, looking to the meaning of the words chosen by the legislator is the great common denominator among all who are trying to ascertain the meaning of statutes. And the, so the possibility of predictability and certainty which is an essential element of the rule of law and the equal application of law to different people. You know, I, I mean, this is important stuff. We got to look at the words and, and constrain our inquiry to the words as much as possible. So we opened the door with BC Motor Vehicles. So let's change gears a bit, talk about the Constitution. Okay. Is the con first and foremost, is the Constitution a statute to be interpreted like a statute? Well, actually, for much of our history, it was. The British North America Act 1867 was a British statute. And you look at some of the old cases, uh, the Privy Council and below them, the Supreme Court of Canada and courts below it, uh, looked at it as just ordinary garden variety statutory interpretation. That is correct. Okay, and I mean, obviously, we, we most At people... At that time. The, yes, and, and in the last, I, I would say, 30, 40 years, uh, I think most people in this room would be aware the living tree doctrine has kind of replaced that. There's no living tree doctrine in ordinary statutory interpretation, really, uh, but there is a living tree doctrine in constitutional interpretation. A lot of people would argue that a constitution is a, a fundamentally different kind of document from an ordinary statute. It can't be interpreted... Uh, the way an ordinary statute would be interpreted. We need this living tree uh, mentality. So first of all, is that settled? If you're taking on a charter case and someone makes a living tree argument and they say, and Justice Stratus, as you know, it's well established the Constitution's a living tree and, and so therefore, uh, do you cut them off and do you say, no, it's not established or, or, or do you do you admit that? And is that water over the dam that we have a living tree? Well, no, I don't think it's... You're giving the impression this is all really quite resolved. It is not resolved. Uh, it, just looking at Supreme Court jurisprudence itself, sometimes they deploy the living tree, uh, this sort of broad idea of the Constitution as a living document, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the Supreme Court does originalism, which is looking at the original intention at the time of Confederation, or more rarely in 1982, they don't right. do that so much, uh, to divine the meaning of the document. Right. Uh, and and uh, one of my uh, concerns as a judge who wants to obey the Supreme Court of Canada is I'm not sure that there really is a consistent a method of interpretation. Uh, and I would like that predictability, and I think litigants deserve it. It may be that certain types of interpretation are better in certain circumstances. Uh, the Supreme Court, in a case, 1985, called Société des Acadiens, said that fundamental constitutional compromises, language rights compromises, we should look at the deal that was struck and be careful not to disrupt the old deal that was made. We need more jurisprudence like that that tell us what interpretive rule to use at what time. But let me, let me go back a bit about this living tree stuff. First of all, for the benefit of the non-lawyers in the room, uh, to some extent we're talking in code, we're talking about living tree, and they must be wondering, well, how did we get from statutory interpretation to horticulture? How does this work? <laughs> uh, what year was it, Asher? 1925? 29. 29. Uh, the Edwards case. And this was a constitutional case that went all the way to the Privy Council in England, which at that time was our highest court. And the issue was whether, under the appointments section in the British North America Act 1867, 
uh, it said that uh, qualified persons could be appointed to the Senate of Canada. And the issue arose, are women persons for the purposes of that section? The Supreme Court said, no, for the purposes of that section, women are not persons. It goes to the Privy Council, and the Privy Council reverses and rules that women are persons for the purposes of appointment, so we could have female senators. The case, in part because of those facts, which are very poignant and very important, the case has taken on a bit of a mythological status, and cementing its mythological status is a line in the case that says that the Constitution of Canada, the British North America Act, 1867, is a living tree capable of growth and expansion within its natural limits. It's a lovely metaphor. But you, you, look, at this, you look at the case itself. You know, that sounds almost like a modern charter case, flowing language, right. evoking sort of a political idea and so on. The case wasn't about that at all. It was a dreadfully boring <laughs> analysis word by word, section by section, of the British North America Act 1867. It was dry. It's garden variety, textual, statutory interpretation. Right. And in the middle of this desert of, of, of pretty dry analysis, technical analysis, was this beautiful metaphor. And it was deployed decades later pretty much in the 80s, the Supreme Court, like an archaeologist, sort of dusts this off and it's, says, it's, aha, it's, the Constitution's a living tree. And, and they ran with it. It was, cited, it was almost not cited for five decades. That's right. And, and uh, suddenly comes back in the 80s. Chief Justice, uh, sorry, uh, Justice Dixon, as he then was around 1980, I think, yes. was, he, wasn't he the first to kind of pick up yes. to justify broader, more expansionist views of, of the constitutional document? Yes. And what, what bothers me about that, I mean, I, the living tree doctrine from a normative perspective, I've, I've got problems with it from the rule of law perspective. But what it has also bothered me about it is this sort of mythology, as you put it, that, well, this is just how we've always done it. You know, this is the Canadian way. We've been doing this since 1929. And if it weren't for the living tree, women wouldn't be persons today. Right. And you can't argue against that. I mean, that, you know, that's a pretty foolproof uh, argument in favor of the living tree. And, and then to say, well, actually, this was a garden variety uh, originalist, textualist interpretation. And then the decision fell into obscurity for five decades. Right. I, I think that that changes the, the landscape, and I've written about that. I know Scott Reed has written about that. Uh, Justice Miller, before he became a judge, yes. I think wrote the definitive uh, paper on that. Uh, so in terms of the living tree, is there, is, does it have any application to you, in your view, in proper interpretation? I mean, some people would say that, well, we need a living tree to an extent, you know, because airplanes didn't exist in 1867, computers didn't exist in 1867. Is that living tree to, to take those new phenomena into account, or is that something different? Okay, two points I think need to be made here. First of all, the interesting thing about the court's use of living tree is they plucked out half the quote from Edwards, okay? The quote again is, the Constitution is a living tree capable of growth and expansion, underlined now, within its natural limits. It actually is a metaphor not for endless expansion, but for balance. And that seems to have been lost. And actually, the vision of the Canadian Constitution as a document of balance I think is textually supported. Look at section one. Right. The rights and freedoms are guaranteed subject to reasonable limits, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, balance is what it's all about. That seems to have been lost. I regret that I think the living tree gets trotted out to justify expansionist visions of the particular constitutional provision involved. That happens not just in the Supreme Court, but lower courts too. I would prefer to see a constitutional law that's more principled. It seems to me, going to your point about, you know, constitution uh, needs to deal with modern circumstances, it originates, 
the written constitution originates in our country from 1867. Airplanes weren't invented. Uh, so how do we deal with airplanes? My first comment is, well, we now have an amendment formula. The constitution was amended and aeronautics has been added to the constitution. So let's not forget that changes to the constitution when it's under-inclusive that, that there is an amendment formula. We seem to have forgotten that. Right. And I think that has implications concerning the extent to which courts can, can puff up certain provisions. Let's go further. Suppose there were no amendment that brought aeronautics into the act. Then one looks at the heads of power, federal heads under 91, provincial heads under 92, and perhaps by looking individually at the heads of power and analogizing sort of what the language is evoking, right. you might come to some conclusions. So for example, this gets technical, but lawyers may follow, 9210 exempts from provincial power and thus makes federal uh, lines of communication works or undertakings that connect provinces. Right. Well, hey, airplanes and aeronautics cross borders too. That may be taken by the constitutional interpreter as a clue, a pretty good clue, that this should be federal, yes. not provincial. So you see, the language or the interpretation emanates not from some guidebook that says, make it as broad as possible and so on, but rather like a detective chasing down textual clues, trying to understand the meaning of the document and the implications of the meaning. And, and, That's how you go about it. That, of course, I think, Asher, dictates a much narrower judicial role yes. than some judges might like. In that way, too, what you've just said, it's no different from statutory interpretation because you can have an ordinary statute that at the time it was enacted, uh, certain things didn't exist, and, and, and that's st but the well, statute not is, well, is... Well, not always. I mean, how do you No, not always, but, it, but in yeah. some circumstances, and the, the idea that the statute's always speaking to new circumstances, so the law doesn't change, but the law has to be applied to new circumstances that didn't exist. But how do you deal with Section 7 of the Charter, another part of our Constitution, that gives everyone a right to liberty? Well, I don't deal with it at all. You deal with right? it. We have to deal with it. <laughs> how do you deal with it? Well, you might have to as a lawyer, though in your practice right. perhaps not. But, I mean, how do you deal with that provision? And, and, and defenders of the living tree approach to constitutional adjudication say you're driven to look to that. Well, it's interesting. Um, back, I was, uh, you know, an important part of my training as a jurist was uh, as a law clerk in the Supreme Court of Canada under Justice Bertha Wilson, 1986 to 1987. And we had to come up with meanings for what appeared to be vague charter language. And what that court was, was fearsomely dedicated to doing was to ascertain the purpose of the guarantee by undertaking an exhaustive investigation of the historical, legal, and philosophical roots of the right or freedom, and to investigate sort of the potential scope of the thing, and to try to ask themselves, although it's a very uncertain question, what was intended by putting this in our Constitution? Right. And that's the best you can do. But the idea of saying, you know, uh, it's a living tree, so we're going to give it the most broad, expansionary meaning possible shouldn't be part of the equation. It should be a more nuanced investigation the way a, detector, a detective would look at the matter, you know, looking at the clues that exist that might help to inform us. So. Um in, in the spirit of the uh, 12 Days of Christmas symposium that uh, Leonid Sirota and Mark Mancini recently I did posted. read that. Yeah. Oh, you, okay. Yeah. Well, I, so I'm not going to ask you the, your, your top five worst decisions, but since we're on the <laughs> subject of li living tree, what are some of the living tree decisions specifically that you think... Uh, where you think either the metaphor was misused or, or the court went too far. In, okay, in, in well, I'll name things. one. I'll name one. But in naming it, 
people have to realize that it's a precedent on the books. And if you come to my court and you try and convince me to overrule it, I, I would say, sorry, I don't overrule the Supreme Court of Canada. It's not my job description. I have to apply their decisions faithfully and honestly and genuinely, and it's not for me to carve down what they say. That's not how our system works. That being said, uh, and, and you'll see, you'll see. Actually, I may reach the same result of the Supreme Court. I don't know. I haven't been given the argument on it. But a very controversial case where the living tree was used was the motor vehicle reference, 1985, I believe. Um, this was the decision of the Supreme Court that looked at Section Seven of the Charter. Section Seven says everyone has the right to life liberty and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with fundamental justice. Now, there was a view before this case that that was only a procedural guarantee. People would cite the use of principles of fundamental justice rather than the American term uh, due process. Due process in the United States had been given a broader substantive meaning, not just procedural. Uh, and, and, and the Supreme Court found that it had substantive content. Right. So, for example, government, you know, they can't attenuate certain types of hearings. That would be a procedural violation. Substantive means that if the tribunal fails to follow certain norms or certain rules, someone could say, they have to follow the rule. The charter requires them to follow the substantive rule. Right. That's a substantive nature of the guarantee. Justice Lemaire, as he then was, relied on the living tree. And he said, and I would say somewhat naively, that in Canada, and this was only three years after the Charter came into force, he said, debates about the proper way to interpret the Charter are resolved, done, no controversy. It's a living tree. And the living tree dictates this expansionary view so the full purpose of the guarantee can be realized. And through that interpretive method, he defaults to so, of course, Section 7 contains a substantive right. guarantee. He doesn't look at the fact that, for instance, the committee that was studying the Charter and involved in its drafting took express steps to restrict it to purpose. Now, the reason why I'm kind of agnostic on the issue, at least until I hear argument from people, is there are arguments that one can marshal outside of the living tree to suggest that the provision should have substantive content. I don't know. I haven't thought about the issue in, right. in, in a sense. So the, Justice Lemaire may have reached the right result for the wrong reasons. I don't know. But to rely on this living tree thing as, as the primary justification I think is a barren exercise of, of, stat, uh, of, of constitutional interpretation. Okay. Well, I won't ask you any further, to, to list any further cases. And I can't really express preferences on cases, yeah. and in part, it's no part of my function because um, I have to obey the yes. Supreme Court of Canada. BC Motor Vehicles was also on my 12 Days of Christmas list. It was indeed. Yeah. <laughs> it was and, indeed. Uh, so uh, I, I just want to ask you maybe one or two more questions. Sure. Um, just kind of wrapping this all up, uh, it, it seems to me that the theme is sort of law on the one hand, justice on the other, and, and people yeah. obviously don't, a lot of people don't fit it so definitively into one camp or the other, it's a, it's a spectrum. But on the one hand, really what you've been saying tonight is, is that law has value in, in and of itself. Yes. And that seems to be where the, the fault line lies. What is what is its value? How, how valuable is it? My own view is that uh, we need law because law is the only thing that prevents violence and tyranny in a society in the long term. And so the only time you could ever say that justice should outweigh laws, even laws that we, we think are, are quite bad, is when the law itself is doing violence, when, when there's slavery imposed by law or, or genocide or, or something quite extreme like that. Then I would say that 
a judge can at that point say that the law has, has uh, attacked its very foundation. Um, what is oh, your... Can I, can I go back? Yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ashley. Well, I was going to say, well, what's, your, what's your view on that? If, if, let's imagine for a second this is, uh, you know, Australia, New Zealand, where there is no charter, and a, okay. law, is, a law is passed that is, you know, Nazi-like in its implications. Right. Uh, do you have a breaking point right. where, where you say, you know, I'm a, I'm a rule of law guy, but justice must prevail. Right. Uh, I, I, I have a line, and my line's here, and Justice Isabella's line's down there, where, but we all have our line, and so I, and there are things that, you know, there are things that even I will not abide in the, in the name of law. Right. Let me, before I tackle that question, okay. I want to take a, a run-up to it and reiterate just to some extent the importance of this. I am not elected, and barring misconduct, you're all stuck with me until October 21st, 2035. <laughs> Do you want me making laws? Do you want me with my values, whatever they may be, and some friends are now grinning here, do you want me to make law? You can't get rid of me. Now that's a very practical reason why you might favor a restricted role for the judiciary. Call me an idealist though. I think of history, uh, right back to the meadows at Runnymede through the English Civil War and the Bill of Rights, much blood has been spilled to enshrine a principle that we take for granted. And that principle is those that make law are subject to the consent of the people in popular election. And if we don't like them, we'll have an opportunity to toss them. That really, really matters. And I think that principle is sacred. And the idea to me that somehow with my narrow life as a lawyer and cloistered, cut off role as a judge, the idea that I'm somehow entitled to fashion law myself really causes me grave concern. Now to your question. So tyranny takes over, and we have uh, Nazi-type laws. What do I do? You know, that question was put to Justice Scalia. Right. And he gave an answer, and I disagree with his answer. He said he would resign as a judge and not implement the law. I would say this. Once a judge quits, no one listens to them. Your power as a sitting judge within the system is to speak on matters of interest. And it should not happen very often, for most judges, maybe never. But there is an occasion where a judge must speak to defend the system that they swore an oath to. I would suggest if Justice Scalia were still around, rest in peace, I would suggest to him the better course is to stay on and exercise that exceptional privilege that a public office holder who is a judge has, which is to speak out and say, no, you should not be doing this. And in my case, it would be an awfully long reserve. When you say they wouldn't get a very fast judgment. <laughs> and in the hearing, and there would have to be a hearing, I would exercise my free speech long, loud, and hard. Because the, in the bottom line, government cannot go on without the consent of the people. Right. And there may be, and this is rare, but there may be a situation where a judge has a role to get the people to rise up and deal with a tyrant. We haven't seen that in our history. Okay. And I hope we don't. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so I, but the worst yeah. choice, I think, is to resign and, in effect, I, I, I in effect abstain from a monstrous situation. So when you say you'd speak out, I just want to 
particularize that? Are you saying you'd speak out in the judgment itself and, and you would say, it may I, be I in acknowledge the, the... No, not in the judgment, because then I'd be functus. It would be in the hearing. But and it would be very but, loud. Would you... I, I guess what I want to know is, is there a way that you would essentially, at that point, make a living tree and say, well, even though there's no constitutional provision against this law, I'm going to say that this violates some kind of natural law, therefore this law is, is null and void. Well, let's face it, let's face it, and God forbid we ever go here. The first step that would happen in such a challenge is somebody would seek a stay of the, of the government action. And let's say we granted the stay pending the whole challenge. The real issue will take place on the streets. Will the stay be respected? Will the public rise up to support the stay? Right. That's why, in the end, the best guarantee of a democracy isn't judges making laws. It isn't even parliament making laws. It's a well-informed, active populace that's prepared to defend fundamental values. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. That's very well said. OK, one, one final question. So the, the question is, do the rules matter? Do the words matter anymore? And the rules. Do, so do the words matter anymore? I would say yes, but I wish for more people they would matter an awful lot more. And, and, and in saying this, no one should understand me to be a stick, strict textualist. I don't believe that statutes should always be given narrow meanings. When you come across carefully chosen words of the legislature that imply a broad meaning as a servant of the people and as someone who is a law applier rather than a lawmaker, I will recognize that authentic meaning and give it full voice. And you know an interesting thing is that's ideologically neutral. That's not conservative, that's not liberal. If next October we have our federal election and a party of a different hue, no matter what hue comes in, my job as a sitting justice, like the baseball umpire, is to call the balls and the strikes and not to cheat about it, to do my best job at implementing the authentic meaning of the laws passed by the people's representatives. Well, thank you, Justice Stratus. That was great. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. The mic is right there. Please be more like Justice McLaughlin and pithy and less like Justice Duff in your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was great and very important. Very, very important. Why do you say it's important? Can because it seems to me like we're starting to lose hold of the ideas that you've described. If you, more and more judgments, especially at the higher levels, as you've described yourself, seem to be rejecting the ideas that you've just talked about. I'd be interested to know from, from both of you, actually, what your response is to one of the typical responses when this set of ideas is expressed. Sometimes the response is, well, that's all very well, but you're really just being formalists. There is inherent ambiguity in words. And what you're doing as a formalist is ignoring that ambiguity mm -hmm. and pretending that you're just being a mechanic, whereas we are being honest in what we're doing. We are taking the words and we're admitting to making things up because that's all you can do. And, yeah. and, and in, in contrast, what you're doing is telling us essentially a lie. You're pretending to be objective about it and, and, uh, and, and so on. So what, what is your typical response to, to, that, to that argument? Balderdash. <laughs> <laughs> My view is this. Uh, there are different cases, right? And in some cases, you're dealing with provisions that are quite clear. If it explodes into a courtroom, it's likely to be unclear. That's why there's a dispute. The degree of lack of clarity depends. But the chain of reasoning you just deployed is because whenever it's in a court, there is some degree of ambiguity. Therefore, this is a golden ticket that allows me, in an unconstrained way, 
to inject my views and my personal ideologies and my experiences into Parliament's legislation. Sorry, that's not my job. It's not. The fact that there's ambiguity is a license to me only to try my best with the tools at hand, looking at the clues in the legislation to solve the ambiguity, not to inject what I think is right in any way, shape, or form. I, I agree. I mean, arguments like that started in the 70s with, with uh, then Professor Lask and Professor Letterman, where they were saying that about the British North America Act. We have to stop interpreting it so uh, mechanically because it can mean whatever we want it to mean. I, I, just because something is never going to be perfect doesn't mean that we throw out the exercise altogether and we stop trying. Uh, any human institution is going to have imperfections. And by giving it our best shot, we narrow significantly the ambit of permissible interpretations. And I think in most cases, we narrow that ambit to one. Uh, I, I agree with Justice Stratus. I, I've been to court where we've been arguing over the meaning of a term uh, or, of a, or of a sentence. And th yes, there's people who disagree and they have good faith arguments on both sides. But at the end of the day, I I've never walked away from a courtroom where I've said, where I've just thrown up my hands and said, there's no way we could have ever answered this question. There's almost always one answer that is better than the others. You know, I, 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 I'll use the analogy, it's overused, but I think it's overused because it's apt, the baseball umpire. Now, I bet you, I don't know a baseball umpire, but I bet you they have views about teams, about players, about who's a jerk, who's not a jerk. They may quietly, within their families, say, yay Red Sox, boo Yankees, perhaps, who knows. But their job in their profession is to set aside their views and to work as hard as they can to have a consistent strike zone and to call it exactly as they see it. As judges, that is our professional ethos. Legal realists say we all have biases. Yeah, sure, we have views. Absolutely, we have views. But our job, just as it is for a lawyer to hold client confidential, information confidential, our ethos is, is to work very, very hard to call it exactly as we see it, given the available evidence in the statute. That, that's great, guys. Very well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for being here. Um, you mentioned a problem with the way the living tree quote is given. I would suggest there's a second problem with the okay. way it's normally given. The um, Judicial Committee of the Privy Council did not say the British North America Act is a living tree. It said, and I quote, Planted. the British North America Act planted in Canada a living tree capable right. of growth and expansion within its natural limits. And that is significant because the real purpose of mentioning the living tree was to create a distinction between the precedents that existed in Britain with regard to the interpretation of Section 1 of the Interpretation Act, which says that a reference to a man is a reference to yes. man or woman. Yes. But in uh, British uh, jurisprudence, Viscountess Rhonda's case had determined that nonetheless, women were ineligible to sit in the House of Lords. So this was a way of pointing out that Viscountess Rhonda's case as a 1912 case could not apply to Canadian jurisprudence, given the fact that a separate body of precedents had developed post-1867. I, I know you already know that. I, I, just think that's, to get that no, I think that's a really valuable contribution. It just underscores the point that this particular sentence in this decision has, has assumed mythological yeah. status. It, it's also important to understand, and uh, Scott, I think your point goes to this, that Canada's constitutional order is not just Unlike the United States, it's not just one document, and in fact, it's not just documents. There are documents, but there are also unwritten constitutional principles. And it's one thing to say that those principles could be a living tree. In other words, the, the job of the prime minister of the cabinet could grow organically over time. It's another thing to say that uh, a statute, what effectively amounts to a statutory provision like the British North America Act, the meaning of that provision can change over time. Right. I mean, the, the argument that one is pushed into if one takes the current orthodoxy on this case is that the judges were effectively saying, or Lord Sankey was effectively saying, the British North America Act meant one thing in 1867. Our views evolved as 1929 were modern people. 
now it means something different because of that fact. Uh, when in fact, the argument they're making quite clearly is that what was restraining the appointment of women to the Senate in 1868 or 1869 was simply the unwillingness of political actors to appoint women. They were never ineligible to do so. Uh, the actual question I had is this. Um, the, uh, sometimes the Supreme Court rules that the Constitution is a living tree, and sometimes it rules that, and therefore the intentions of the framers are irrelevant. Other times it rules that the intentions are sacrosanct, as in the Senate reference ruling. It doesn't make clear which doctrine it's gonna use until after it's made its ruling, yes. creating a problem that I literally would not know, going before the Supreme Court, which argument I'm supposed to take the, yes. the framers' intentions are sacrosanct or irrelevant. I brushed up against this very issue. It would be very, very helpful if we had a guidebook about what method of interpretation ought to apply in what circumstances. Um, in Justice Miller's uh, uh, article that Asher mentioned, he makes the same point. He says there's clearly some living tree going on, there's clearly some originalism going on, but Canada doesn't have, uh, has not done enough work yet. And this isn't just a Supreme Court problem, I think it's the judiciary as a whole and counsel who make submissions to us. We have not yet uh, thought sufficiently, and the academic world, I can't leave them out, we have not thought sufficiently yet about what methods of constitutional, appro uh, of, uh, constitutional interpretation are appropriate in what circumstances. And I see that very much as Justice Miller's uh, excellent point in his article. Thank you. I, I think we, we need to be careful too in, in coming up with reasons for why one area should garner a different type of uh, interpretation. You know, if we're saying that the, you know, the historic bargain cases should be originalist because we want to understand the bargain that was struck, well, what are rights? Rights are bargains, effectively, that are struck between the people and, and the state. And very literally, a bargain was struck in making our, con in making our charter and the 1867 uh, Constitution. So I, I don't understand why, if we're looking at it in terms of understanding the contract, why we wouldn't take an originalist approach uh, in the rights sphere when, we're, when the court's very willing to do so in the historical bargain sphere. It's a discussion and a debate that has not been had in Canada enough. And in a way, and I don't mean any real criticism of it, he was a great jurist, but Justice Lemaire, as he then was later a distinguished chief justice, you know, in, in motor vehicles, said the debate's over, and the debate hadn't even started yet. And in a way, through this discussion, uh, in an effort to foster more, more study and thought about it, I think we need to have a thought, a discussion, a debate, uh, about how to interpret constitu constitutional provisions. I must say, as a sitting judge, I would really appreciate it if counsel came to court and, and rather than just telling me, what they think the provision means. They actually told me, relying on great academic work, great historical work, and so on, why a provision should be interpreted using a certain methodology. I don't get that submission. One of my purposes of being here is an effort to get people to think about this, because it would be great if we had a dialogue within uh, the academy, the bar, and the judiciary over this issue. But it's unspoken, and I think Justice Lemaire, uh, it no doubt wasn't his intention, but he squelched that debate from ever happening in this country. It's been happening in the States, as we know. Yes. Well, and that's been happening in, in the Running Meat Society. Indeed. For the last few years. Indeed. Thank you very much. I think it's a non-lawyer's question about praxis that follows up on the previous question. Uh, you raised, I think, a couple of problems that are afoot that you doing your job properly as a judge can't address or remedy. So you can avoid contributing to them, you can avoid generating some, you know, the flower use of metaphor or introducing extraneous principles, but you can't necessarily fix the problem. Um, so from a practical standpoint, there was this thoroughgoing metaphor with both of your comments about opaque lenses, getting clarity, getting transparency. Uh, my understanding as a non-lawyer, with law there's sometimes an idea of void for vagueness but there isn't necessarily a corrective principle of equivalent weight for a bad decision, just to, to, to keep it in shorthand. What is the way that the doctrine that would be helpful, that, that we, we heard about tonight, uh, gets 
promulgated? How does it actually get rolled out or, or in, in brought into the institution? And then, since judges are bound by the Supreme Court, uh, how do bad decisions get revisited? Uh, very complicated question. Got a couple Sorry. days. No, it's good. Uh, I think, I, and I hope I get uh, the gist of an answer to you, because it's a, it's a rollicking good question. It begins, I think, in the academy, in the law schools, the people that have time to reflect and think over such issues. We need more work in this area. It requires lawyers with an academic bent who listen to the academy, who uh, aren't just you know, technicians who do their job nine to five, but people that love the law, that try to learn new insights, to take these new insights from the academy and deploy them in court. And finally, it takes judges with a little bit of courage to write up some law beyond the well-trodden roots to say new things, to deploy ideas. And the court system, I think, once new ideas are deployed, is very good at having them assessed. The role of lower courts and intermediate appellate courts like mine is we come up with ideas. At the end of the day, those ideas, when we write them up, become law within our jurisdiction. But ultimately, the Supreme Court of Canada has the final say, and it rules on whether the ideas are good or bad. But, you know, there's this sense that people have that the Supreme Court is responsible and we have to look to the Supreme Court to fix everything. Ah, 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 ah. You got it completely backwards. It begins with the lawyer working late at night researching a problem. It begins with the academic who's wondering what research to devote herself or himself to. It's a very microscopic thing that needs to be weld up, put in the public forum for study and debate, and then tried out. That's, I think, the way it has to evolve. Thank you. Uh, I appreciated your comment on the Empire Strikes Zone because my father-in-law, who's a staunch Republican in the States, so you can guess where he falls on the side of the political spectrum, that's his favorite analogy. Um, but I would point out that I think there's consensus across Major League Baseball that even some umpires have a narrower strike zone and some have a broad. Hey, I'm a baseball fan and I've got good lungs and I've told them so. Fair enough. <laughs> it but I think makes that, me mad. Right. But you know, like bad de judicial decisions make me mad too. Fair I enough. mean, people have to do their job according to the correct professional code. Fair enough, fair enough. Boo. My question is, <laughs> there you go. My question is a bit of a spin, I guess, on what Professor Party had asked with the first question. And it's the question of, we talk about legislative intent, and of course, as a court, I see courts really, they operate in two spheres. In one sense, when the court is developing strictly the common law, and this often happens in private law, et cetera, the court has its own, there's, there's sources that it's drawing on in order to figure out how to kind of develop that law. Of course, once you get into public law, where you're dealing with statutes, the topic of tonight, you're much more constrained because you're actually, look, the authority for what you're making, for the decision you're making is drawn from the statute and not so much from, the statute is then developed by the common law, I guess. But, but I see a little bit of a difference between the two. That's not actually the point. More I'm going to the public law side. What do you do in situations where the legislature has honestly not turn their mind to the dispute before the court. I'm not sure what you mean by turn their mind. Sure. This goes back to my comment about intention. Sure. Uh, I think the only thing I can do as a jurist is look at the words used. I, I'm, I'm not sure I can draw inferences about whether they turn to their mind. Well, I figured that you know you've been you spent a whole hour talking to us, and you haven't even mentioned the standard of review yet, administrative law. You want me to? So I thought this would be a good <laughs> chance because this is something that I struggle with. It it, it did plays it, into standard right? review. Right? Did a did a legislator sit there and say, when we draft whatever provisions that you're going to look at in order to inform how a particular administrative body should be reviewed by a court? Right. We know, for example, and without getting too specific, there's a statutory appeal, so a court has an right. oversight function. Right. Do we know, did, did the legislature sit there and say, well, there's going to be questions of facts, mixed questions of fact and law, questions of law, questions of law within expertise, questions of law without expertise. Right. And in constructing the statutory appeal, the legislature actually turned their mind to the meticulous nature of how it's going to play out and all that? Or is okay. the court essentially filling in some of those? Okay, good question. Let me, let me take a stab at it this way. Um, statutes are a form of communication. It's how legislators speak to the world, including courts. And when they speak, they wish to be understood. 
And so they will use words, they will employ words that invoke particular meanings. Assisting in the communication effort are canons of interpretation. Courts have announced how they read words. And so smart legislators, uh, smart drafters of legislation will be aware of that and draft in such a way as to get a reaction from courts. Uh, to get technical about administrative law, there is a type of clause known, as you know, as a privative clause, which is a clause that says this decision of administrative tribunal is final and shall not be re reviewed, questioned, or overturned by any court. But courts, under the rubric of the rule of law, will nevertheless overturn when there's an assault on the rule of law and one would say unreasonableness as that's understood in administrative law. That becomes something the drafter knows when it communicates. It knows that we will review it. Now, up until a case called COSA from the Supreme Court of Canada, when the legislature said an appeal lies from the such and such tribunal, the legislature could be confident in knowing that we would review it as a full appeal with no deference on questions of law. That all changed in COSA when the Supreme Court said, when a legislature says appeal, that really means judicial review, and so all the deferential stuff for judicial review applies to those appeals. Query whether that was a proper statutory interpretation result. Uh, and so I don't know if I'm making sense, but there's a bit of a dialogue between legislatures and courts, and courts have to be very careful that they're not distorting or perverting the dialogue in some way as they read statutes. So then to pick up on that. And the legislature yeah. needs to be given the power to enact what it thinks is right, short of a constitutional violation. Right. So then the second half of my question then to pick up on that is, yeah. so the legislature always has the power to amend. So post COSA, the legislature could have easily come in and said, actually correctness courts, review. it should have been correctness review. They can do that. And they've done that in British so, Columbia sure. under the British Columbia Administrative Tribunals so Act. So then what do subsequent courts do about that legislative silence, I guess is the question. What do we do when we say, oh, that clear, the court was clearly off, and maybe this is just the previous question in a different way. The court was clearly off on something 10, 15, 20 years ago, but the legislature's done nothing about it. They've obviously acquiesced to this judicial interpretation that maybe originally did miss an, an injustice. That has to be the result. Yeah. The legislature, short of a constitutional violation, always has the power to oust a court decision. Right. And, and that's the rules of the game. Uh, and, you know, I, let me go to a place that some people go. Some people say, because legislatures are busy, and they don't get around to doing things, courts should do things that obviously the legislature should have done. Um, that's a very convenient vessel for courts implementing their views into legislation, which from my standpoint is a no-no. Thank you. Yep. Justice Stratus, initially I'd just like to say I enjoy... Oh. By the way. Is this the last one? Yes. Oh, hopefully it's decent. Make it good. You should go uh, sit. <laughs> I'd just like to say I enjoyed your dissent in the uh, Bonniebrook case. Oh, yes. Did yeah. you want to say a word or two about what it is for other people's benefit? Uh, I encourage people to read paragraph 90. It's one, <laughs> it's one sentence long. This is the issue of whether uh, courts, when reviewing administrative decisions where the administrator has not written much, should courts get in the business of supplementing tribunal decisions? I guess you know my views on that. <laughs> not um, much. My, my question is actually somewhat they should related do their to... Job. Sorry. My they question should is do somewhat... <laughs> Um, my question is somewhat related to the last question, dealing with canons maybe. I'm just yeah. wondering how we get to a more textualist and less purposivist future. Um, it seems that, like you said, a lot of the um, issues are when a statute's purpose are defined too broadly. Yeah. So do we need a canon that says that maybe as something that the late uh, Justice Scalia would have approved of that uh, the purpose should be defined uh, in the most concrete terms possible? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, it would be a mistake for courts ever to dictate to legislatures how to draft their legislation. That being said, smart 
legislative drafters should read court decisions and understand how courts react. There's no question that in many cases clearer legislative drafting uh, would solve a lot of problems. Uh, that's not meant as criticism. Many statutes are, are remarkably clear. Um, it, as you can see, it's kind of an interactive process between the branches of government. My only plea today is each should stay, stay in their lane and trust the other to do what they think is best and play its position, nothing more. Uh, I have to emphasize again, especially since this is the closing question, courts are singularly inapt to get input from the public, to research on their own motion, to study a problem, to develop solutions and then splice them into legislation. You know what? I have a good law library with fabulous staff. I have a law clerk. I have a wonderful judicial assistant who's just so efficient. That doesn't make me in any way, shape, or form capable of being a legislator. Does that answer your question, sort of? Yeah, I, I think it does. Yeah, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.